Hello, my name is Frank Silverman. I'm the Executive Director of Martial Arts Industry Association. And I'm here to guide you through the August edition of the Success Kits DVD. Let's go to Sacramento, California and join Master Dave Kovar where he talks to us about potential. Hello and welcome to the Maya Monthly Instructors video. My name is Dave Kovar. Let's get started. This month our theme is potential. First off, what does that mean as an instructor? When we're talking about potential, we've got to believe our students. We've got to believe in the potential of our students. Every one of you guys right now teaches someone that you probably don't think is going to do very well. And every one of you guys in the past, those you've been teaching for a while, have had somebody in the past that, man, you didn't know if they could do it or not, but they stuck it out and now they're good, solid martial artists. And so what's important is we can never determine, we can't t take someone and write them off like they're never going to mount anything. We've got to believe in every student that we have. I want to share a story with you guys. Many have heard this before and it has to do with a, a grade school. Uh, princi principal calls in one of the instructors, one of the teachers and says, guess what? We just did a test. You're the best teacher in the school and we, because of that we're going to give you the best students. Now these students don't act like they're the best. They look like normal, act like normal kids, but they are the best. We gave them special tests. And so congratulations on earning the privilege to work with the best kids in the school. And the school year comes around. Guess what happens? Those students test the highest in the school. And of course, uh, the principal brings that same teacher in the office and goes, I just want to congratulate you on, on those students performing at such a high level. And, and the teacher goes, well, uh, thank you, but really, they were the best students, you know, so of course they're going to perform at a high level. And the, and the uh, principal goes, oh, uh, guess what? I forgot to tell you, they weren't the best students. We just picked them randomly. And the teacher's kind of shocked. You're kidding. Then, she, then he's thinking for a minute. He goes, oh, I know. He goes, well, I don't know how to say this without being sounding arrogant, but I am the best teacher in the school. And the principal goes, oh, there's one other thing I forgot to tell you, is that you weren't the best teacher. Your name was just pulled out of a hat. And the teacher's kind of shocked. And anyway, the bottom line is, is what made it happen was that teacher believed in the students. And there's a phrase, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am, which is a fancy way of saying if you believe in your students and, they, and, and you tell them, I believe in you, you can do this, they're going to go, well, my teacher thinks I can do it. I must be able to. So just uh, looking at all the people today when you teach class or tomorrow, just be aware. Just believe in them and give them the benefit of the doubt, and you'll be surprised uh, what can happen. Is it going to happen every time? Maybe not, but it, it can more than one time. I'm going to call some junior students out, and we're going to talk about potential. So let's go get juniors. Come on out here, please. Yeah. You've been seeing these guys a lot the last couple months, and we have Melissa and Aaron and Bailey and Dylan and Alex. How y'all doing today? Good, sir. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Nice, good, solid attention stance. Class, hop! And bow. All right, guys, everybody huddle and take a knee. So sit down, cross your legs. How's that? Sure. All right, and let's get comfortable here. Get it nice and tight so the camera can see you. You guys are a sharp-looking crew. I know we've been talking about lots of stuff, and you guys have been doing martial arts anywhere from, oh, I don't know, six, eight months now on to several years. So you guys are really starting to get the sense of this. And all the things that we're talking about today, you guys have heard before. Uh, today I want to talk about potential. Everybody say potential. potential. You know what potential means? It's really uh, what it means is your, how much potential means, is how what the possibility, how good you can be good at, how good you can be at something. That was what I meant to say. And nobody really ever knows quite what their potential is. But what's important is, first off, is that uh, in order to become good at whatever it is you want to do, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you don't compare yourself with others. Okay. Now, how many of you guys ever seen someone that had like a really a bike that looks a lot cooler than yours, and you're kind of kind of compared yourself? You guys know what I'm saying. Everybody does it, right? Or someone that maybe does does really a better in math than you, or in spelling than you, or something like that. And sometimes we look at them and we go, "Oh man, I'm not very good." If you compare yourself with the best in a particular area, you might come out like that. Or how many of you guys ever looked at someone that had less than you and thought, "I'm better." Well. The trick is, is that all we want to do is compare ourselves with what we think we can do. Does that make sense, guys? Sure. And that's having potential. That, that's believing in ourselves. Okay, and that's important. Now, the next thing about potential that's important. So, what though I just got done talking about really means run your own race. And what that means is it doesn't matter how everybody else does at school or at karate or at sports. You just do the best you can be. Okay, and that makes it a lot more fun. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is repeat after me. You can always do more. You can always do more. Than you think you can. Than you I'm going to do a little experiment. I, I need a, one of those uh, uh, mitts there, uh, and I'm going to use you there. Good. Okay, I'm going to have you. This is what I want you to do, Aaron. With your hand, put your right leg back. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. I want you to, with your hand, show me how high you think you can kick. Don't kick. Just show me with your hand how high you think you can kick. Let's turn you a little bit so they can see a little bit more. Show me. Do you think you can kick this high, this high, this high, this high? How? Just show me. Quick, quick. Okay, you think you can kick about that high. I want you to do a front kick. Is that what you said? Yeah. Go for it. Okay, look at that. Now watch this. 
guess what? You just kicked like three inches higher than you thought you could. Okay, so what's the moral? You can always do more than you think you can. Outstanding job. Have a seat there. Thank you, sir. So, guys, you always want to set the goals high because sometimes we don't, I don't know if I can get my black belt. I don't know if I can get my secondary. I don't know if I can get straight S in spelling. But you can always do more than you think you can. All right, one more time. We say you can always do more, you can always do more. than you think you can. You think Stand you up, can. place this way, guys, at ease position and class. Hup! And Bow, you're out of there, except Alex and uh, Mr. Cowley, come on out as well. I want you to get some mitts for me. All right, guys, we're going to do a little drill we call three count. It's just kind of a fun little pattern. I'm going to have you hold for me, sir. Let's get you on this side over here. I'm going to have you, do you know this one, sir? Good deal. All right. So what's going to happen is, is this is a combination. There's actually six different variations, and it's just a nice way to dis disguise repetition. What we're going to do is we're going to work a jab cross, and then the third technique, that's what we call a three count, is going to vary every time. So I'm with the first time I want you to go jab cross, and then the same elbow. Start out of range and shuffle into it. Ready? And go for it. Jab cross. Hey. Nice. Do that same one again. Start a little farther away every time. And go. Jab cross. Hey. Nice. Now the next one I want you to go jab cross elbow. Got it? And go. Jab cross. Hey. Nice. Do that same one again. Go. Jab cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I always have a challenge getting the students to start out of range. So every time I'm going to remind you to get out of range, because if you're sparring with Mr. Cowley, you're not this close to him, are you? Okay, all right. So now I want you to go jab, cross, knee, and start a little farther away, and shuffle in, and go. Jab, cross. Hey. Nice. One more time. Same one. Start a little farther away. There you go. Go. Jab, cross. Hey. Now I want you to go jab, cross, lead knee. Ready? And go. Hey. Nice. Switch. Keep those hands up, and go. Let's do that one more time. Start a little farther away and make sure to hit it nice and hard. Ready? And go! Jab, cross, lead knee. Hey. Good. Now I want you to go jab, cross, back leg, round kick. Ready? And start a little farther away. There you go. Go! Jab, cross. Hey. Nice. Same one again. Ready? And a little farther away. And go! Jab, cross. Hey. And lead leg, round kick now. Ready? And go! Jab, cross. Hey. Good. Last time with that one. And go! So what happened is the first two techniques were always the same, the third one varied, okay? And so it's just a nice way to mix it up. So Mr. Kelly, what I'm going to have you do is move around a little bit, and we're just going to go right in order, sure. all, all six of them. Are you ready, buddy? So you're the first one, second one, third one, but whenever he has the pads up, that's when you're going to go. And you're just going to kind of move, stay wet with him, and try not to get too close to him, just like we did, okay? All right? But I tell you what, if he gets too close to you, swat him as hard as you can on the top of that. Just kidding on that, but all right, all right, all right, here we go. Ready? And go for it. First one. Nice, nice. Moving around. There it is. Move it around. Hey. Looking good. Looking good. Hey. All right. Hey. All right. All right. All right. Hey. Very nice. Face your instructor. Hup. And bow. You're excused there. So I'm going to have you go through this with me, okay? Sorry. All right. Now, what we're going to do with this is the only thing I'm going to do different is I'm going to kind of swat at him every now and if he gets too close. And I'm gonna, he's going to have to stay right with me as far as moving. Now, let's just stay right in order, okay? okay. All right. So here we go. Boy, you have some big forearms. Those are nice and loose. Here we go. So if he's too close to me, which he's probably not going to be because he knows not to be, he's going to, uh, I'm going to swat at him. And hope. Jab, cross. Move it around. Again, one more time. Next one. Nice. Puss. Good, good. Last one, last one. Oh, gosh, we have two more. Puss. Puss. All right, now, same thing what we can do with that once we have that basic order. By the way, if you're going to hit tie pads too often, you probably ought to have wraps and gloves on. We're doing it for video, so we're not. But more than a few punches, and of course, it starts taking its toll on the wrist. Now, how we might vary that is we might just simply, what I'm going to do this time is let's just do the first one. Sure. Okay, jab, cross, elbow. Is what I might do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him block first. So I'm going to go like so, and then I'm going to sit back. I'm going to block here. Guys, have the idea. So then I can have him do a couple, and I can go successively to where I go. He blocks. Let's go first one, block, second one, all the way down the line. Sure. Hopefully, I, okay, here we go. You guys have the ID all the way down through. Very nice, sir. Sure. Cool. So we call it that three count. And the whole significance of that is in a classroom, you want to find as many ways as you possibly can do to present the same information to just keep it fun and exciting and innovative. A uh, couple things to remember with that is just keep it as basic as possible. Make sure that your, your students think in terms, of, in terms of it being intense and focused. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of the show.
One of the most important things we do as martial artists is become instructors, and of course that's the reason you're probably watching this DVD, is how to become a better instructor and a better martial artist. So with that, we're going to join my schools in Orlando, Florida. We're going to join Jenny Silverman while she teaches us how to help people learn better. Hello, my name is Jenny Silverman. Today, I'll be discussing the three different ways that people learn for the Maya instructor video. Understanding these three methods will help you to make your students the best that they can be. The three ways that people learn are orally, visually, and kinesthetically. In other words, they hear it, they see it, or they feel it. What we're going to do today is we're going to demonstrate the three different ways of teaching and the three different ways that people learn. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with visual learners. This is going to encompass the majority of your students. These are the students that see a technique and can typically mimic it or imitate it. You've seen these students come in the door. They come in and they can do all these jump kicks and stuff like that. When you ask them if they've ever trained before, they say no. They say, I saw it on TV and they can do it. So these are your visual learners. Second step is your oral learners. Your oral learners take what they hear and implement it into action. So to help these students, it's really important that you're specific with your details. They're gonna pick up what you say and put it into action. Your last group, which is probably gonna be your smallest group, are your kinesthetic learners. These are typically the students that, that struggle the most because as you're demonstrating techniques, a lot of times you'll demonstrate it physically and talk about it verbally. These students actually need a proper physical touch to do the technique correctly. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna give examples and demonstrations of the different ways that people learn. So let me start off with Aaron Lehman. Come on up. Us. All right, and turn and face me. Kiss key. Us. All right, so what I'm gonna have Aaron do is just completely follow what I do and give an example of what a visual learner might see in a class. So ready, Aaron? All I want you to do is whatever you see me do, you're gonna do the same thing. Us. All right. Hold that right there for me. Keep that punch out for me. So a teaching tip for visual learners is as you're facing your students, make sure you're doing mirror image because they're going to imitate exactly what they see. So if you saw with Aaron, anything that I did, he followed. So let's even watch with small details. See if you can follow along. Good. And kiss key. Us. Excellent. Thank you very much. And back in Cezanne. So that's an example of, of the way a visual learner might follow your lead in class. Now something that's very important is they say that your students will do 75% of what you do. So it's important that you give it your all and really focus on little details in your technique also because your students are going to be watching and imitating what you do. So now let's move on to an oral learner or students that learn by hearing what you're saying. So let me have Aaron Lundy come on up. Us. What I'm going to work on with Aaron is I'm going to try not to demonstrate everything or anything. I'm going to have him just follow along with my commands. So ready? Kiss key. Us. Good. Make sure those feet are in a V. Good. Cross your arms. Step out. Height. And hands down. Hands on your hips. Bend those knees just a little bit more. Good. And punch with your right hand. Height. Good. As you're working with an oral learner, it's important that you give specific directions as for an example, like right hand, left hand, lower, higher. You want to give them a picture of what they need to do, but you got to make that picture happen with your words. So ready? Punch higher with your other hand. Height. Good. And bring that punch down. Lower. Good. Chamber your other hand properly. And switch hands. Height. Good. Bend those knees just a little bit. Even more. Good. And punch with a key. Height. Us. Height. Us. Kiss key. Us. Thank you very much. All right, so that's an example of students that are going to hear what you're saying and make that into action. So our last group, the kinesthetic group, I'm going to have Haley come on up. Uh. What I'm going to do with Haley is I'm not going to talk and I'm not going to demonstrate. What I'm going to try and do is, well, I'll have to talk a little bit, but I'm not going to demonstrate things. And I'm going to make all the corrections with my hands physically. So ready? Let me see you cross your arms. Good. And what I want is I'm going to want her fist to get a little tighter. So I'm actually tightening up her fist as I'm telling her. It's a little tighter. And I'm pulling her arms out. And step out. Height. Good. And hands on your hips. Good. Now I want her hands to go a little bit higher. So I'm just going to move her hands up with a proper touch. Just right there. Slight touch. And let me see you punch. Height. Good. If I wanted this punch to happen a little bit higher or maybe centered, 
I just very gently move her hand. And same thing with the other hand. Height. Good. And if you notice, I gave her a little physical cue as to what I wanted. Now the other hand. Height. Good. And now up high. Height. Good. I'm giving her physical cues the whole time that I'm teaching her. And kiss Keat. Excellent job, Haley. And let me have you sit in and say that. So we covered the three ways. Visual, they're going to see what you do. Orally, they're going to hear what you say. Kinesthetic, you're going to need to have some proper physical touches in there to help them do their technique. So now what do we do when we have a group of students and you're going to have visual, oral, and kinesthetic learners in there. So let's see what happens. Let me have everyone stand up. Us! Kiss Us! So I'm saying what I want. I'm also demonstrating to them. So now we're covering our oral and our visual learners in this class. So ready? Let me have everyone cross their arms. Good. And we might have a kinesthetic learner in there that's just struggling, maybe not doing exactly what we want. So I'm giving details. Maybe I tell them, pull their hands out, cross at the forearms, not the wrist, and they're still struggling. So that's the student I'm just going to walk around really quickly and fix their technique right before we go. So now we've covered visual, oral, and kinesthetic. So ready? Everyone step out. Kibarach, hands in front. Hi. Us. Good. Let me see everyone bend those knees. They're seeing it and they're hearing it. Good. And hands on your hips. Good. And now I'm going to come around to my kinesthetic learner and just fix the chambers just a little bit. And center punch, right hand first with a key eye. Hi. Good, everyone bend those knees just a little bit so you'll, there are some oral learners there. And switch hands, hi. Yes. Everyone make sure that punch is right in the center. Good, so we're gonna have some students that do it automatically because they heard it, some of them saw me do it, and maybe we have someone that just didn't get it. As I'm walking my lines, I'm just gonna make that correction for them. Good, and everyone kiss key. Yes. Sitting in says that. So that's how you would handle it. If you had kinesthetic, oral, and visual learners, Say what you want, demonstrate what you want. Remember, they're gonna do 75% of what you do, so make sure if you want them to drop into a good stance, you're not demonstrating it halfway. And your kinesthetic learners, those are important. As you're walking your lines, just to make small, proper physical corrections. So, hope these techniques help you in your classes. Again, my name is Jenny Silverman for Maya. Hope to see you in another instructor video soon. sure everybody found that information very useful, but now we're going to go to a topic that we probably don't enjoy talking about too much, and it's injuries. But it's very, very important. It's, it's important on the safety aspect to talk about injuries and what to do if they happen. It's also important on the legal aspect what to do if they happen. This can keep us out of a lot of trouble later down the road. So we're going to join here in my headquarters in Oklahoma City. We're going to talk to Matt Giacchetti, and he's going to talk to us about open wounds. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Cicchetti, I'm president of Life Force USA, a national safety and health training company. I'm also chief medical director for ITC, executive protection training program. I'm an EMT and I'm also a second degree black belt in Kempo and Upkeeto. Today we're going to talk about open wounds and what happens when there's bleeding. The most important thing to keep in mind is me. I'm number one. Not to be vain, but anytime there's any type of injury, I have to worry about my personal protection before I can help the person who's injured. And that means I need to minimize my contact with this person's blood or other bodily fluids. The best way to do that is wear a pair of gloves, which I'll demonstrate to you in a minute when I show how to wrap a wound. There's several types of open wounds. There's an abrasion, like when you slide into third base if you're playing softball and you wear a pair of shorts and you get that nice raspberry up your leg. There's a laceration, which is a cut. It could be straight or it could be jagged. There's a puncture wound created by an impaled object, such as a nail or a pen or something in that nature. And there's also an avulsion. An avulsion is a rip or tear of the skin, almost like a bite uh, that's taken out of the, uh, the body part. When we're dealing with wounds, we got to know if it's severe bleeding or minor bleeding because we need to know how to treat each one accordingly. If it's a minor wound, such as an abrasion, we're going to treat it a little bit different than we would if it was a major wound where much blood loss is happening. A minor wound, we really don't need to call 911, but we need to take several precautions. Again, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put gloves on. And then we're going to wash the wound out. The reason we need to wash the wound out is to prevent infection. Infection is my number one enemy when I'm dealing with an open wound. The best thing to use, especially on kids in the martial arts or kids anywhere, is Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo. The reason, what are kids afraid of when you put anything on an open wound? It's going to burn. It's going to hurt. 
kids are programmed since they were little ones that Johnson Johnson baby shampoo creates no tears. It's a soap, it's just especially soap for our hair. So we can get the psychological aspect of using the Johnson Johnson baby shampoo and it's gonna be non-abrasive and non-burning if we try to wash the wound out. After we wash the wound out, we're gonna apply direct pressure. We're gonna, we could put an antibiotic ointment on, such as a Neosporin, and then put a bandage on, such as a Band-Aid. Let the parents know to check the wound a couple times a day to make sure there's no type of infection. If it's getting brown or pussy, if they do, tell them to seek, you know, see a doctor or seek medical help. A major wound. A major wound's gonna be classified as something where we're losing lots of blood. Not blood just trickling out, but blood flowing out of the body. We don't have time to clean the wound. We're gonna call 911 and we're gonna apply pressure. At this point, infection's not my main concern. My main concern is to control the bleeding in, from the body. After I apply direct pressure, I'm gonna do two steps, depending on which, how the body's situated, which one will go first. I'll either wrap the wound with the ACE bandage and then elevate, or I'll elevate and then wrap. It's gonna depend if the person's sitting on the ground, if it's a leg injured, if it's an arm injured. Again, I'll demonstrate that in a second. After we control the bleeding through elevation and wrapping and pressure, we're gonna do a fourth step if it's necessary, and that's a pressure point. We'll only use a pressure point if after we wrap it and it doesn't control the bleeding, we try another wrap or two. If it still doesn't control the bleeding, we can go to a pressure point on the inside of the arm called the brachial artery between the bicep and tricep, or where the leg, hip, and groin meet in the femoral artery. Here we're gonna squeeze the artery slowing the flow of blood down, not trying to stop it. Here we're going to take the heel of our hand, we're gonna press into this artery up towards the person's abdomen. This will help slow the flow of blood down until medical help can get there. Let me introduce Jared, he's my assistant today. We're gonna to teach you how to put a couple bandages on. First bandage I'm gonna teach you is if it's a minor wound and it's an abrasion. First thing I said is you put gloves on. This person might be crying or freaking out uncontrollably, but they're not gonna die in the five seconds it's gonna take you to put gloves on. If a parent ever says, why are you putting gloves on? My little child's clean. The best way to get around that is, ma'am, I've been helping many people throughout my life. I just wanna make sure the child's safe from me. Always put it back in yourself. That way you don't have to be like, well, your child's dirty. So I'm gonna put it back on myself. If my victim here or my, my, my partner here, Jarrett, has the ability to, I'll have him apply pressure himself. I'll try to minimize my contact with his bodily fluids. When we apply pressure we're using some type of bandage, we're gonna use something clean or sterile. So if you don't have those nice sterile four by four gauze pads in your, back, in your first aid kit, we can get a paper towel right out of the bathroom or off, off, out of our office. Here, Jarrett, please apply that pressure. Jarrett, we're gonna make believe, has a wound on his forearm. After he does that, we're gonna take a nice ACE bandage and we're gonna apply a pressure bandage. Why an ace bandage? They're flexible, they're pliable, they're absorbent. If I drop it, it's easier to roll up than gauze rolls. So it's the best thing out there. If this is a minor wound, I actually wanna promote bleeding. Bleeding here is not my enemy because it's just trickling. Remember, I wanna minimize infection. So what I'm gonna do, if it's a minor wound, I'm gonna make my tightest tie, my first tie is my anchor. I'm gonna make that furthest away from the heart. So I'm gonna come to the end of the injury. I'm gonna make that tie snug, not tight to cut off oxygen or cut off blood supply, but snug, and the rest of it is gonna be nice and loose. Why nice and loose? Again, we're gonna promote bleeding. The reason we're promoting bleeding is we wanna get any dirt or any particles that gotten in there from the person, from the contact with the ground or whatever, to come out. Our main goal here is to minimize infection. Now, when we get to the end, if you don't have tape, or if you don't have any type of nice hooks where you can hook this, you can just make a tie. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a little ear. And you're gonna take the end of it, and you're gonna wrap it and tie it. If we can, we tie it over the wound. It gives a little bit more pressure. If not, wherever we tie it works great. If it's still bleeding a little bit, I can tell Jared to go ahead back and apply pressure and pull that arm in. And at this point, he's keeping it elevated and he's applying pressure to it. That's for a minor wound. Let's take this off. If this was a major wound, the only real difference at this point, he'll still apply direct pressure, is this tightest tie is gonna go closest to the heart. Now I wanna slow the flow of blood down. And the whole tie, the whole bandage is gonna be much more snug than the one for the abrasion. I do not wanna promote bleeding. I wanna get this 
above and below the injury site, always talk to the person, get them part of the team, make them part of the process so it kind of takes their mind off of what's going on. So I'm going to continue and I'm asking them, is this too tight? Can you feel any tingling or pain in your hand? And I'm going to make that same tie. I'll make a little ear, like when we were taught how to tie our shoes when we were little kids, pull that around and tie it. Again, preferably over the injury site. At this point, I can come down, I can check Jared's fingers. I can ask him, are they tingling? I can maybe pinch to see, does the blood come back quickly? What that means is I'll pinch his fingernail and I'll count to two or three and I want to make sure it comes back to red. If not, this is either too tight where I can loosen it or we have more damage that 911 is a necessity. If the blood flows through, I can take another bandage and go over the top of this. I never want to take one off and put another one on because then I'm opening up the infection again. At this point, again, Jarrett will bring it in. He'll apply direct pressure. He'll elevate it. If last resort comes and I can't slow the flow of bleeding down, I can go to his pressure point, which I'm just going to grip under his arm, take my four fingers and press inside where his bicep and tricep is, and try to slow the flow of bleeding down. If I can't slow the bleeding down, I need to apply pressure to the pressure point. What we're going to do, and just for demonstration purposes, we'll bring Jared's arm out. You're going to take your hand underneath his arm, taking your fingers between the bicep and tricep, and squeeze. We want to do this hard enough that we slow the flow of blood down, but not stop the flow of blood completely, because we still have to worry about the parts past injury getting blood supply to be able to live and function. Why don't we use a tourniquet if we can't slow bleeding down? Tourniquets are a last resort, and the only time you're really going to use a tourniquet is if it means saving this person's life, but losing this limb. That usually comes when the part is torn off, an amputation, where I can't control the bleeding. Most of the times, this type of process where we apply pressure, apply bandage, apply elevation, and possibly a pressure point is going to control the bleeding until 911 gets there. I'd like to thank my partner, Jarrett. Thank you, Jarrett. I'd like to thank you for having me here. Hope you learned a lot today about how to recognize and control open wounds and bleeding. Look forward to seeing you next time in the next Maya kit. Be safe and be prepared. As usual, that was great information by Matt Giacchetti. Last month, this segment for the instructor segment or the training segment, we were joined by Master Bill Wallace where he spoke to us and gave us tips on stretching and flexibility. We had great response from that, so we wanted to do another segment with Master Bill Wallace before we go on to some other instructors. And so he put together a special video section for us titled Sparring, Sparring Techniques and Sparring Drills. Hope everybody enjoys and learns a lot. Hi, Bill Wallace for Maya. Everybody knows that I kick. I love kicking people in the head. But with the advent of kickboxing, with the advent of the no holds barred competition coming up, boxing became very, very important in our training. Why? Because we wore gloves. We wore wrappings on our hands and no longer were we punching with these two knuckles. Now we were punching with the entire glove. The punching had to change. It couldn't be a, a penetrating type of a punch anymore. It had to be a concussive type of a punch. So we had to change the way we punched. We couldn't just penetrate the body anymore. We had to, to hit it and bring, bring it back, be able to protect ourselves. So that's why I want to kind of demonstrate and work with you some very, very simple boxing techniques. All of us have boxing in us. Because why? There's only four punches. In all of boxing, there's only four punches. The jab, the cross, the hook, and the uppercut. That's all there is. Everything else, every other punch that you've ever seen is a modification, a, a transfigure of one of those four punches. The beauty of it is also is there's two punches that are straight line, two punches that are curved line. The jab and the cross are straight line movements coming straight at you. The curved line movements are the hook and the uppercuts. Absolutely beautiful, isn't it? It is a science. Plus also, understand, when I'm in a punching position like this, the hips and shoulders do all the punching. The arm, the hand, the fist is an extension of that shoulder, is an extension of that hip. When I throw the jab, it's just not a, 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 a but it's boom, you turn, you turn. When you throw the right hand, you turn, you push off. 
If you've ever worn a pair of boxing shoes, you notice that they don't have something. They don't have a heel. Why? You should never be on your heel. You've seen boxing matches. You, you, you always hear about the, the commentator talking about he can't box backing up. He can't box backing up. You can't. You've got to be able to push off coming forward. So that's why you're on your toes. Watch. With me if you want to stand up and kind of try this a little bit, if you would. Take what you think is a boxing stance. Bring your hands up to what you think is a boxing stance. Open your hands up a little bit so they're nice and relaxed. You don't want your arms and we don't want your shoulders and arms to get tired. With your front hand, the one closest to me, you're just going to extend the hand out. See how now this shoulder protects the chin? See how this shoulder now is up close enough to the chin so you can't hit me in the chin? Wow, huh? How's that for protection? Straight line and back. Now watch the cross. Straight out. Oh, son of a gun. This shoulder's protecting the chin also. This hand came straight back, so it's protecting the other side. So I'm looking right down a little cylinder. I'm looking right down a perfect cylinder. This way, this way, and back. Now I'm protected before I throw the technique. I'm protected during the technique. And most of all, I'm protected after the technique. Again, watch. Jab, see how the shoulder turns a little bit, so I'm leaning into it. Jab and back, jab and back, cross and back, cross and back. Just like a karate reverse punch, just like your taekwondo punch, just like your kung fu punches, these twist. Same thing. So the more muscles come into play, the stronger the movement. Now, from a different angle, watch what happens. See where the hands are at protecting. Elbows are in close to protect my body. Out and back, out and back and back. See how the, it's straight out, straight back. The jab, same thing, straight out, straight back. One, two, straight out. One, two, straight out. One, two, straight out. But you breathe. Much like the key eye, much like the key up. It's whew, So you're extending the punch out there. But in boxing, you get hit often. So we want to keep that jaw tight. So it's a nice, quick breathe out. With me now, watch. Jab again cross again. We're half done. Remember, there's only four punches, so we're half done with our boxing training. Here, boom, boom, and back. With me, we're going to do five of them nice and quick. Not real fast, but about half speed, okay, with me. One, two, three, four, five. Watch from the side now. One, two, three, Four, five, not that much different than your training, is it? Just where the hands start and where they come back to. Now comes a little, little difficulty in the movement, the hooking technique. Hooking technique, I feel the hook punch in boxing is the most powerful movement for me. I'm left-handed, I'm left-legged forward. So what happens is I jab and I cross just like we practiced. Now bring the hands back to where they're about even. Now all I'm going to do is turn this one over and turn to where my left knee points to my right knee. Boom. That's simple. You notice the rear hand's up to protect the face. This shoulder's up to protect the chin. Again, protection before, during, and after. And back. Whoa, I'm exactly where I started. Jab, cross, halfway, hook. You notice I didn't bring it way over here. I stopped it right here because if you're right here, I've missed. And if I've missed and I keep going, whose turn is it? I don't ever want it to be your turn. When we spar, when we fight, I want it to be my turn all the time. Makes it a lot more fun for me. So right here, jab, cross, halfway back, and a hook. Good, one more time. Jab, cross, halfway back, and the hook. Now, all one movement, hips and shoulders. Watch again. One, two, three. Whoa, nice and simple, just like a dance. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Now breathe. Now from the side, watch again. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, halfway three. Nice and simple. 
a little quicker now. Nice and simple. It's so simple. Your arms don't get tired because you're totally relaxed. Your hands are relaxed. You're breathing. If you breathe all the way out, what do you have to do? You have to suck it in. Ease of movement. Let it happen naturally. Last movement, the uppercut. Very effective technique, especially if you got your hands in here, you come underneath. What do you hit with an uppercut? What's the target for the uppercut? Stomach. In karate technique, self-defense situation, of course the groin. Stomach, chest, chin, nose. How about whatever gets in the way? Anything that gets in the way. Why? Because I'm vulnerable when I throw the uppercut. If I'm here and I stop the uppercut right here, look at my chin. I can't get that shoulder up there. So when I punch here, see the shoulder comes up and I'm protected. So I'm going boom, boom, and back. I'm protected. But if I go boom, boom, uh-oh, look at that. So what I want to do is I want to punch the ceiling. Boom, boom. With the rear hand, front hand now, I'll punch straight up. See how this arm now protects my face? Or if I jab an uppercut here, protect them. You can't even see my face now. The shoulder protects it. Don't stop it here. I'm open. That's why you see a really good boxer, when he throws the uppercut, and he misses, goes all the way up. Practice. Practice makes perfect. It also makes permanent. So watch. Boom, boom, underneath the guy, straight up with the uppercut, and back. Boom, boom, underneath the guy, straight up with the uppercut. Boom, 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 underneath the guy, straight up with the rear hand. Boom, 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 underneath the guy, straight up with the uppercut. Now the problem with that exercise is, it gets very boring because you're punching something that you don't really see to hit. Besides, there's a better practice for the uppercut. Number one, and simply, you're standing in this position, you jab across, now you just pull your hands to you. Big circles, big circles. Palms are up, and you're bringing the circuit. Watch from the side, big circles. See how the shoulders are working? See how the hips are helping? Then you speed it up a little bit. Then you speed it up a little bit. And you'll speed it up a little bit more. And you'll speed it up a little bit more. And you'll work it and you'll feel it in these shoulders. Then pretty soon everything works. Jab, cross, uppercuts. Jab, cross, hook, jab, cross, hook. All four punches work absolutely perfectly together. All two punches work perfectly together. If you look at the top boxers in the world, all of us remember a guy named Joe Frazier. He had one punch, but it was devastating. It was called a left hook. Mike Tyson, in his prime, had two punches. What were they? The left hook and the uppercut. Probably the most famous boxer of all time. Which punches did he use? Basically, the jab cross. Why? Because he liked them, they were effective for him, and they worked. You don't have to know them all. As in a martial arts, you don't have to know everything. Just what you can make work for you. That's the beauty of the sport. That's the beauty of the movement. In martial arts, we have forms. In boxing, we have forms, per se. Understand what happens. I'm getting ready to fight in three weeks. I've seen films of the guy that I'm fighting. I can't just think about what's happening. I've got to practice against that movement. This is called shadow boxing. I'm practicing my techniques. Every two minutes will be different than the next two minutes. Why? Because it's not written down. It's not practiced, per se but I'm working the techniques that feel good for me. I'm practicing the movements that I like. I'm a jabber and a left hooker, so I throw a lot of jabs, a lot of left hooks, right hands every once in a while just to keep the guy honest. But what I'd like to do is watch, I'm going to do about 30 seconds, about half speed. Understand that there's nobody out here to hit, so I don't want to throw the techniques hard. Understand also that there's still nobody out here to hit, so I don't want to throw them fast. I just want to throw them right. 
so they'll work for me when I do need them. The bell goes ding, boom, and I'm just very simply moving around. And I jab, choo, choo, always protecting now. You know, boom, boom, boom. Always nice and simple movement. Boom, 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 boom. All the time movement. Jab, boom, boom, all the time practicing. Boom, 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 all the time. There's the bad guy. Bam, bam. I got him. I got him. I got him. Boom, 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 boom. Bam, bam. There he is. I got him in the corner. Bam, 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 bam. All the time movement. And bam, 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 bam. Wham. There he is. Bam, bam. Bam, 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 bam. And there he is. Bill Wallace for Maya. Keep punching. So far, it's been great information on this month's DVD, but now let's go back to the philosophical part of the martial arts. Some of the, the reasons that many of us got into martial arts or stayed with martial arts were those special, beyond physical reasons. And every month, as you know, Master Ernie Reyes discusses some of those reasons. So let's join Master Reyes with a frank discussion about the essence of the black belt. <laughs> Welcome everyone. I'll be doing a reading from my martial arts journal, Martial Arts for Life. The topic for today is the essence of the black belt. The black belt is just a piece of inexpensive material, but the essence of the black belt is invaluable. I believe it is one of the greatest treasures of life. The essence of being a black belt is continuously striving for excellence. By striving for excellence in martial arts, we have the potential to strive for excellence in all areas of our life or at home, at school, at work, or play. The original purpose of the black belt was a means to develop that warrior spirit so students could survive. Black belt training in the old days was really taken to the extreme. There were many classes that were filled with blood, sweat, and tears. Students were really pushed beyond their limits. They had to reach deep down, beyond their physical threshold of pain. They were many times forced to tap into that indomitable spirit to bring out the personal best. The black belt represents one of the highest levels of martial arts skill. It is built on the foundation of honor, loyalty, family, and bravery. I believe, as black belt teachers of the 21st century, it is our responsibility to carry on these traditional values that are still so valuable and powerful for modern day times, people, and society. The common everyday person's perception of the black belt is that as someone that is lethal can break boards and bricks, but little did they know that the black belt during modern times has much more power than a kick and a punch. The real power is that it can transform people's lives for the better, beyond the physical threat. It can save people's lives of all ages to survive the mental and spiritual challenges of everyday living. Striving for the martial arts spirit helps us really separate ourselves from accepting mediocrity and striving for a black belt level of martial arts mastery. I am totally certain that if the black belt taught properly with martial arts quality and martial arts ethics can make a difference in this troubled world. There's no substitute for the powerful benefits of the hard work ethic, dedication to never quit, based upon respect and discipline are essential in achieving the black belt. In the old school days, the strong were the ones that really survived. Instructors really didn't care whether you quit or not. But if you really stop and think about it, it's the weak ones that need to survive and make it to black belt. Really, the true warrior spirit is to help the needy and protect the weak. A masterful teacher is a black belt who really can take the worst students with low self-esteem and physical ability and still get them to black belt. Getting these challenged students to black belt are definitely the ones we remember most because it's the power of the black belt that gave them hope and a brighter future to survive in everyday life. As black belt teachers of the 21st century, the goal of developing the black belt mindset must never change. But we all know that the approach of old school training really didn't work to retain students to black belt and beyond. There are more people nowadays that are training in martial arts longer than ever before. It's because the most successful professional martial arts schools have changed their approach to teaching and training. The goal of black belt is the same, but the approach has been changed to focus in on retention and having more compassion for starting students that are beginning, the beginning and the intermediate students. 
once you get your students to advanced levels, I believe that they can handle any type of training that you challenge them to with. But most important, be patient. The modern day approach that is presented in any of the Maya success kits is that the present day martial arts instructor can now explain and articulate more clearly the benefits of the life skills beyond the physical. This is huge in retention. The black belt can be used as a metaphor if you can become a black belt in life and put that same amount of energy, focus, and spirit in other goals of your life, you have the power to do it. How fortunate are we to do what we love doing most and make a living from it? A modern day martial arts teacher, we must carry on the true essence of what a black belt is, and that is conquering yourself. So what is your black belt really worth? It's all about what you've invested in it in the past, and what you invested in it in the future. Black Belt is not a one-stop destination. It's a lifetime journey. Hope to see you in the next Maya Kit in the instructor section. Again, martial arts for life. Asa. I hope everybody enjoyed this month's DVD. We always appreciate your feedback. Call us, tell us which segments you think are best. Email us, tell us which segments you think are best. Our phone number is 866-626-6226. Or you can email me at fsilverman, that's F-S-I-L-V-E-R-M-A-N, at masuccess.com. We always appreciate your feedback, and we look forward to seeing you next month.